Hi folks, welcome to our six part series of mini lectures on the nervous system in the human body. In the first three videos, we're gonna focus on the molecular, cellular, and tissue level of organization in the nervous system, including how nerve cells communicate with one another. In the second three videos, we'll focus on the structure and function of parts of the nervous system that are visible to the naked eye. So I first want to start by talking about the functions of the nervous system. We've already talked in the first week of the course about homeostasis, the idea that the body maintains a fairly stable internal state even as the environment around the body and around cells within the body changes. The, one of the primary jobs of the nervous system is to detect, respond, and then adapt to those changes. This part of the nervous system function is something that's largely below the level of our awareness. The second function of the nervous system is to control movement and integrate the control of movement with our intentions, when we're talking about voluntary movement, um, and also to integrate and control movement of muscle that we can't control voluntarily, namely cardiac muscle and smooth muscle. And last but certainly not least, the nervous system carries out what we think of as higher mental functions our ability to form memories, to pay attention, to make decisions, to feel emotions, to feel sensory stimulation, as well as our ability to generate thought and language. To set the stage for our study of the cellular and molecular and tissue level, I'm going to give you a big picture view first. Um, and then I'm going to show you a short video about how psychoactive drugs affect the nervous system. It's something that most people have at least a passing interest in, and it's also something that you can't understand without the basic cellular and molecular material we're going to cover. All right, so there are two major divisions of the nervous system lots of subdivisions, but two major divisions, the central nervous system, or the CNS, and the peripheral nervous system, or the PNS. The central nervous system is composed of the brain and the spinal cord, both of which are encased in bone as a protective measure. The peripheral nervous system is made of two sets of nerves that are marked off by where they originate. Cranial nerves originate from the brain and the brain stem, and spinal nerves originate from the spinal cord. So take a listen to this quick video on how drugs affect the brain. Don't get caught up in lots of details. There will be some unfamiliar vocabulary, but some, like receptors, for example, that you will know. Most people will take a pill, receive an injection, or otherwise take some kind of medicine during their lives. But most of us don't know anything about how these substances actually work. How can various compounds impact the way we physically feel, think, and even behave. For the most part, this depends on how a drug alters the communication between cells in the brain. There are a number of different ways that can happen. But before it gets into the brain, any drug must first reach the bloodstream on a journey that can take anywhere from seconds to hours, depending on factors like how it's administered. The slowest method is to take a drug orally, because it must be absorbed by our digestive system before it takes effect. Inhaling a drug gets it into the bloodstream faster. 
And injecting a drug intravenously works quickly too, because it pumps the chemicals directly into the blood. Once there, the drug quickly reaches the gates of its destination, the brain. The entrance to this organ is guarded by the blood-brain barrier, which separates blood from the nervous system to keep potentially dangerous substances out. So all drugs must have a specific chemical composition, which gives them the key to unlock this barrier and pass through. Once inside, drugs start to interfere with the brain's normal functioning by targeting its web of neurons and synapses. Neurons are brain cells that have a nucleus, dendrites, and an axon. Synapses are structures placed along the dendrites or the axon, which allow the exchange of electrochemical signals between neurons. Those signals take the form of chemicals called neurotransmitters. Each neurotransmitter plays different roles in regulating our behaviors, emotions, and cognition. But they all work in one of two ways. They can either inhibit the receiving neuron, limiting its activity, or excite it, creating a new electrochemical signal that spreads throughout the network. Any leftover neurotransmitter usually gets degraded or reabsorbed into the transmitting neuron. A drug's effectiveness stems from its ability to manipulate these synaptic transmissions at different phases of the process. That results in an increase or a decrease in the amount of neurotransmitters being spread. For instance, common antidepressants, like SSRIs, stop the reabsorption of serotonin, a neurotransmitter that modulates our moods. This effectively pushes more of it into the neural network. Meanwhile, painkillers, like morphine, raise levels of serotonin and noradrenaline, which regulate energy, arousal, alertness, and pleasure. Those same neurotransmitters also affect endorphin receptors, reducing pain perception. And tranquilizers work by increasing the production of GABA to inhibit neural activity, putting the person in a relaxed or sedated state. What about illegal or illicit drugs? These have powerful impacts on the brain that we're still trying to understand. Crystal meth, an amphetamine, induces a long-lasting release of dopamine, a neurotransmitter linked with the perception of reward and pleasure. It also activates noradrenaline receptors, which increases the heart rate, dilates pupils, and triggers the body's fight-or-flight response. Cocaine blocks the reuptake of dopamine and serotonin, pushing more into the network where they boost energy, create feelings of euphoria, and suppress appetites. And hallucinogenic drugs have some of the most puzzling effects. Substances like LSD, mescaline, and DMT all block the release of serotonin, which regulates mood and impulsivity. They also have an impact on the neural circuits involved in perception, learning, and behavioral regulation, which may explain why these drugs have such powerful impacts. Even if some of these effects sound exciting, there are reasons why some of these drugs are highly controlled and often illegal. Drugs have the power to alter the brain's chemistry, and repeated use can permanently rewire the neural networks that support our ability to think, make decisions, learn, and remember things. There's a lot we still don't know about drugs and their effects, both the good and the bad. But those we do know about are the ones we've studied closely and turned into effective medicines. As our knowledge grows about drugs and the brain, the possibilities will also increase for treating the many medical problems that puzzle researchers today. So as we learned last week, there are two basic kinds of cells in nervous tissue, neurons and glia. Neurons are the unit of function in the nervous system, and glia, which means glue, are, uh, provide a variety of different kinds of support for neurons. There are many types of both neurons and glia. Um, we're going to focus on three kinds of neurons and essentially six kinds of glia. So, as I said, the neuron's the basic unit of function. Um, each neuron has three basic areas. The cell body, which is referred to as the soma. Remember, soma means body. Uh, a single axon, which is the information sending part of the cell, and then 
a host of dendrites. The uh, prefix dendro means branch or tree in Greek. Um, and so you can see that they are very branch-like. You can also just make out the nucleus in the soma and the nucleolus inside it. The small purple dots that you see in this slice of tissue are the nuclei of glial cells. And glial cells outnumber neurons in our nervous systems, at 9 to 10 glial cells for every neuron. So let's look at the structure of a neuron in a little bit more detail. We've got the soma, right, the cell body. That's where you have most of the organelles that you would have in any eukaryotic cell. You have the nucleus with a nucleolus, and you have um, relatively short extensions from the cell body, many of them which are called dendrites. These are just like the uh, branches of a tree that have leaves collect sunlight, the branches of a neuron, the dendrites, collect information. Now the decision about whether or not that information should be passed on to another neuron, nerve cell, depends on an area referred to as the axon hillock. Hillock means tiny hill. And this is the, essentially the decision point about whether or not the signal that was transmitted from other neurons is going to be passed on either to a muscle cell or to another neuron. And that decision point, the axon hillock, has to do with a shift in what kind of membrane proteins are present. The axon hillock is continuous with the single long axon, which carries, if, a, if the signal is going to be passed on, it carries it in an all or none fashion all the way to the end and where you have some more branching into what are referred to as axon or synaptic terminals. And that's the place where the message is actually passed on. One way to see the functioning of the nervous system is that we have a sensory part of the nervous system that brings information in. We have information and processing and integration centers, and then we have areas that generate output. Um, and the structure of the neuron reflects that kind of function as well. So within a neuron, right? So within a neuron, the dendrites receive information. The dendrites and the soma are continually processing information and integrating it. Generating output starts with the axon hillock, and that information is transferred via the axon to the axon terminals, and from there to another neuron. Now, there are many different types of neuron shapes. Um, I would venture to say there are hundreds of different neuron shapes depending on exactly what the neuron is tasked with doing. But there are only three different types of neuron. So we have sensory neurons, which are carrying information from either the special senses or from our skin, our joints, our muscles, our internal organs into the, the central nervous system, which is composed exclusively of what are called interneurons. Remember the prefix inter means between. So interneurons are neurons that occur uh, in between other neurons. And those are the major processing parts of the nervous system. Then we've got motor neurons, which send out commands. Now, the cell body of most motor neurons is in the spinal cord, which is part of the central nervous system. But the axon extends into the peripheral nervous system.
give you a little bit more detail about sensory neurons. They're part of the afferent pathway, which means the incoming pathway, right? Carrying information into the nervous system. And um, that information is derived from sensory receptors, which are specialized nerve endings whether they're and they're specialized for detection of different kinds of stimuli. So for example, the receptors in the eye are sensitive to different wavelengths of light. Sensory receptors in our ears are sensitive to vibration. And um, the, we have pressure receptors and temperature receptors um, built into our skin. So each of those has a diff slightly different shape because it has a diff slightly different um, function. These guys are pretty weird looking. The soma sits in the middle of the, um, of the axon. So you've got dendrites and then you've got a cell body and then an axon. And it's the axon that travels into the central nervous system. So in some cases, the axons are incredibly long. Next, we have interneurons. These exist completely within the central nervous system, which remembers the brain and the spinal cord. The first interneurons receive input from sensory neurons, and then other interneurons get information from other interneurons. Um, we have um, often huge dendritic trees that carry the signal to the soma and then a single axon. Sometimes these axons are very short because they're sending signals to neurons that are very close by. The cell body is located at the beginning of the axon. Next we have one of my personal favorites, the motor neuron. Um, motor neurons are part of the efferent pathway. So it's carrying information away from and out of the central nervous system to an effector, a muscle, a gland. Um, and remember, we've got three different kinds of muscle tissue. And that effector organ is what carries out the response of the nervous system. You've got a large cell body at one end of the axon and motor neurons, the axons are in the peripheral nervous system and they are insulated Schwann cells which produce a lipid rich wrapping. So they're electrical, Schwann cells are electrically insulating the signal that travels down the axon. There are uninsulated gaps between the insulated areas and those are called nodes of Ranvier. All right, on to glia. So there are six types of glial cells and glia have, are, we're learning a lot about them. Um, you know, it, as befits their name, glia, which means glue. Initially, people thought they were solely support cells. And now we understand that they may be involved in some information processing. And as well that um, microglia are actually part of our immune system as well as being glial cells. So we're first going to talk about the glia types of glia that exist in the central nervous system, then we'll focus on the two kinds that are most common in the peripheral nervous system. All right, the first thing I want to point out about the image on this slide is that the we have two neurons and they're the sort of yellow tan color, right? And then each of the different kinds of glial cells is done in a, a, a separate color. The first glia that we're going to talk about are called astrocytes. And astrocytes are green in this image. And the prefix astro 
means star. So these are star-shaped cells. I, I realize everything here looks vaguely star-shaped, um, but they're star-shaped cells. They physically surround and support neurons, sort of holding them in place. And um, although a, uh, a preserved brain is sort of rubbery, uh, a living brain is pretty mushy sort of like oatmeal. Um, so the glial cells are really important in terms of holding things together. The second really critical function of astrocytes is to supply nutrients and oxygen to neurons. So direct your attention to this structure, which represents a tiny blood vessel. You can kind of see some red blood cells in there. And notice that the green astrocyte has processes that are wrapped around this small blood vessel and also processes that directly contact the neuron. That's one really simple way when you're looking at a diagram to recognize that what you're looking at is an astrocyte. Astrocytes form part of the blood-brain barrier that was described in the video. So they're critically important for the protecting the brain from a lot of material that's present in the bloodstream that might damage the nervous system. So the brain is a really privileged organ in that sense. Next we're going to talk about microglia and these are the ones that are red or reddish brown in this image. The prefix micro means small, so small glia. Um, for a long time, their function was a little bit of a mis mystery, but we now realize that microglia are part of the immune system of the brain. They, they're definitely glia, they make proteins that only glia make, but they also can phagocytize parts of and get rid of parts of dead neurons. They can destroy pathogens when they encounter them. Uh, interestingly, it turns out that microglia are primarily active when we're asleep, and we think that that may explain the relationship between chronic sleep deprivation and the risk for dementia in later life. Next we're going to talk about ependymal cells. Try to say it, because if you can say it, you can remember it. Ependymal cells. Um, the append ependymal glial cells are located at the boundary between the brain and the spinal cord and uh, the ventricles, which are fluid-filled chambers within the brain. The ependymal cells in this image are pink, and you've got the ventricle in the sort of pale blue color. Ependymal cells have cilia on the surface facing into the ventricle, and in fact they help produce cerebral spinal fluid and the constant movement of the cilia helps to remove waste that might settle on the surface of the ventricles. Ependema, by the way, means outer garment, which is where the name comes from. Next we have oligodendrocytes. Again, try to say it because if you can say it, you can remember it. Oligodendrocytes um, the, literally means few tree or branch cells, so cells with few branches. And these are the cells in the central nervous system that electrically insulate parts of axons. And that facilitates transmission of information down the axon because that signal is carried by the exchange of ions between 
the inside of the axon and the extracellular fluid. Without that insulating covering, what you end up with is signal crosstalk. So essentially leakage of electricity from one axon to the other. And that's actually what happens in an autoimmune disease called multiple sclerosis. All right, on to the peripheral nervous system. The first glial cell we're gonna talk about is the Schwann cell, which I mentioned before in the context of motor neurons. So you only see Schwann cells in the peripheral nervous system and their job, like the job of the oligodendrocytes in the central nervous system, is to electrically insulate axons from one another. And so that, again, that's going to help with transmitting a signal from one neuron to the next. One important difference to take note of between oligodendrocytes and Schwann cells is that each Schwann cell can only insulate a small portion of an axon. So this is a Schwann cell, this is another one, this is another one, this is another one. And that's very different than oligodendrocytes. So if you look here, this oligodendrocyte is reaching out and providing insulation for axons of more than one neuron. Next in the peripheral nervous system, we have satellite cells. Satellite cells have a function very similar to astrocytes in the central nervous system. That is that they hold <clears throat> neurons in place and they also provide nourishment to the neurons. In this image, the, in, the, in the drawing, what we have is um, a single neuron that's the yellow um, and then satellite cells around the top, sort of covering it. Um, in the micrograph, we have a section of spinal cord here and then um, it's very difficult to see, but there's a small box in here um, and that shows us the location of cell bodies of sensory neurons and then the satellite cells with the nuclei that are arranged all the way around them. So a little more detail about that insulating covering. It's referred to as a myelin sheath, whether it's made by Schwann cells in the peripheral nervous system or oligodendrocytes in the central nervous system. Right, the sheath itself is primarily lipid. It provides electrical insulation. Um, and the longer an axon is, the more likely it is to have a myelin sheath. And that's because having that insulating covering, which means you don't lose ions to the extracellular fluid, and so the signal Right. If you lose ions, that means your signal is going to get smaller and smaller and smaller as you move away from the cell body, from the axon hillock. If you have a myelin sheath, the only place you may lose ions is at the nodes of Ranvier, which are the gaps between them. So the longer an axon is, the longer the distance the signal has to travel is, and so the more important the myelin sheath is. Having a myelin sheath means that an axon can carry a signal more rapidly than if it's unmyelinated. All right, so if you have two axons of the same length, one myelinated, one my unmyelinated, the one with the myelin sheath is going to send a signal faster. Finally, in the peripheral nervous system, the myelin sheaths that provided by Schwann cells can serve as a pathway 
for the, for axons to follow as they regrow toward their targets. And you have to think, right, if an axon is cut and it starts to regrow, how does it know how to get back to where it originally ended? Um, and the answer to that is sometimes it does know and other times it ends up um, innervating or sending its axon to the wrong place. Myelin sheaths help guide axons to the correct location. So that's our introduction to the structure of the major types of cells in the nervous system, neurons and glia. We talked about sensory neurons, which are part of the afferent path, interneurons, which are located exclusively in the central nervous system and sit between other neurons, motor neurons, which carry out, which carry commands to effectors. And then we talked about the six different types of glia, microglia, ependymal cells, astrocytes, and oligodendrocytes in the central nervous system, and Schwann cells and satellite cells in the peripheral nervous system. In the next video, we're going to talk about how information is transferred between neurons.